You're listening to That Gets My Goat. Get a little closer. Don't be shy. Get a little closer with With arid extra dry. Hey, everybody. Why did we do that? No reason. Oh, kind of like I will have no reason to do the... uh, Light em up, up, up. What's that song called? Uh, my songs know what you did in the dark. I think is the name of that song. Oh, yeah. At any point, just be warned. I during may... this show, you may just burst into song. Yeah, but that particular song. So that be warned. It's a song. what? Is, what is the thing? A trigger warning? Is that? <laughs> <laughs> yes, and that's a subject for another night. It but... is definitely a triggering song. I would say because it's awful. <laughs> My songs know what you did in the dark. <laughs> oh, wow. And yeah, we may even get that version of it. So, yes, be warned. I'm, I'm sorry. That is something that may happen again. Hopefully that... For all we know, that could be the last appearance of it. Yeah, we'll try not to let that happen again, guys. <laughs> we care about you as our listeners. It could be... As the, our listener. Right. So, it's that gets my goat. Mm-hmm. And I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rish Outfield. And... This is exciting. We're in a new place. Well, it's new for me. I think you've been here lots of times, right? I have been here lots of times. I've written stories here, stories about here. And uh, this is a good, a good place for writing because there's so few distractions. We're at my family cabin up in the mountains, the cabin in the woods. Rated it off. It's a place that my uncle and my father built, and uh, then they built on, and it got bigger and bigger, and uh, there's no television here. Uh, there's one radio station you're able to pick up, and it's kind of a good radio station, but it, it's kind of a bad radio station at the same time because it's the one. So they try and please everybody. So you'll have like big band music, and you'll have Nirvana on the same playlist. And it's like, that was Nat King Cole, and now we've got Tony Basil with Mickey coming up. The Foo Fighters. Yeah, it's just like, I, why? What? <laughs> He's like, oh, that was Black Sabbath. And now we've got... Wiz Khalifa. <laughs> well, Wiz Khalifa. <laughs> and at the top of the hour, Celine Dion, folks. And, and you're just like, how? What? Why would you do that? And I, it's so schizophrenic. But sometimes we'll play it because every like third song will please somebody here. <laughs> like my mom will be like, oh, that's nice. They played that oh. Barbara Streisand song. You know, when your daddy and I were, uh, were dating, the brief moment that we were in love, this song was... Pop- <laughs> and... I, anyway, sorry. Oh, so there's not a lot of stuff going on at this cabin to distract. You're forced to read or you're forced to sleep or you're forced to, I mean, in your case, it would be forced to make yet another child. But with me, as always, I have the chance to write. And uh, I might be willing to come back to this cabin if that's actually what we get forced to do. Is that- you say that now. <laughs> But uh, think about it. Just just for a minute. Think about what you're uh, agreeing to. 18 more years of what you go through every night. But yes, it's a family, it's a family cabin. And for years, I think, I've been saying, we should go up there and we'll, uh, we'll podcast and we'll... Well, I, did I say what we would write? I don't know. I think that was the original plan before there was ever the podcasting. It was just like, we go up there, it would be a writer's retreat. We have to write. We could collaborate on a story or we could do whatever then we just didn't go that summer and then the next summer oh yeah we 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 just i was up there for the first time this year and we we should totally do that this year and oh yeah i'd I'd love to go and then we didn't go again and so it's been several years and yeah for once we actually came but it took some pardon my english jiggering to get this to happen because i had to ask for a weekend off at work which doesn't happen, right? Well, I tend to work a lot of weekends um, because I will do what they say. I, I don't know why I didn't work there. <laughs> but yeah, I, I had a weekend coming. And so I said, okay, well, I'll pick this weekend. And I, I let you know well in advance. Hey, what about this weekend? Or maybe you, I said, it could be this weekend or another weekend. And you said, well, it would be better if it were that other weekend. And then you, do you still have to work tomorrow? No, there was but, a guy who was going to. Yeah, not there was work. there was the possibility that something like that might occur, because yeah, of course, once we decided this was the week it was going to be, several people quit at <laughs> once at work, and so right now we're stretched so thin that uh, working weekends, working 
over time, et cetera, et cetera, has become the norm right now until we get uh, the people replaced, which it always happens. And on top of that, several people also quit at my wife's work. So she is also working all the time. So I don't even see her. This was probably the one day that I would see her for this month. And instead, I came here with you. So the, the interesting thing is next month, I'll have a lot of time to do things like this because we will by then be divorced um, <laughs> because of me choosing to come here. Here's the I mean, but you, you sound like you're exaggerating. You're not. Here's another thing to add to that, though. She was sick today, so she called in sick. So you would have been able to spend the day together and you would have been able to you know, play nursemaid or, or, you know, one of those things that I suppose happens in a, in a relationship. I wouldn't know. Candy stripe or something like that. And that's right. My favorite uh, 80s Christian metal band. <laughs> and so, sorry, my favorite 80s gay Christian metal your, band. Your favorite 80s Christian metal children's band. <laughs> there, that's the one. I couldn't quite remember <laughs> who I was thinking of. But, uh, yeah, it's really surprising that uh, we got to do this. I, I fully expected... Because I didn't hear from you for a couple of days. I fully expected, well, hey, we're not going to be able to do it. And I was like, well, that's okay. I mean, I've got the weekend off anyway. I, you know, I'll find something to do. I, I can I, go up there by myself. And I there's, thought there's about rafters that. that I could easily hang myself from. If I had come here by myself, though, I would have accomplished so much re- re- writing. And I, you so know, I have much more than we accomplished. Well, yeah. So far. I, I, well, okay, tell the good listener. How much writing we have accomplished in the hours we've been here today? Okay, we've been here for a few hours and we've accomplished zero writing. But the night isn't young anymore, <laughs> so we will likely accomplish zero writing today. <sighs> you did type a few words up from your notebook, though. Uh, almost a whole paragraph. <laughs> While I, you know, every time I stopped talking for a, a sentence or so, you would pop it open. Or a sentence, that's not what you do. You stop talking for a a few seconds. Well, uh, every time I pause and ruminate for five seconds, you'd be like, and then I'd start it up again. And you're like, okay, I can't pay attention enough well enough to type this, so I'll have to listen to you more. Well, we were talking about busyness and how much overtime and all that stuff you have, and I've been working a lot, but I make a little bit of money for my writing now, and people are like, hey, why don't you put so and so out and all that? And so if I could just stop everything but that and focus on that then i would make a, a little bit more from yeah. my writing i can't i i couldn't quite sell i would make a lot from my writing because that wouldn't happen you might move up from beer money to beer and pizza money yes and that's not nothing you know right and it's it's a bedrock and it's more than i was making from my writing two years ago or whatever if i just apply myself and i we always talk about what Dean Wesley Smith advises, you know, because he, he makes a living from his writing. Or, okay, well, let's call a spade a spade. He makes a living from his wife's writing. And <laughs> he says you have to have, what's his number? 50, right? Yeah, I think he's, I don't know if that's exactly what it takes, but that's an easy number to point at to say once you've got 50 things that people can buy from you, you know, they can just keep coming back for more and more and more and more and more and more. As long as they read something and say, hey, I liked that. He said, then you're set. Because you're not depending on the one book that you wrote to bring in money. You get a little bit of money for every single one of these 50 things that you wrote that are for sale. And that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not a math guy. But that's kind of the kind of math I can understand. And so I try to do that because I have well over 50 stories, as you know. If I just put them all out there and each one made me a couple bucks. A couple bucks that's times beer 50 and pizza is, is money. Right? A lot more than a couple bucks times one. It is. And so I, I keep meaning to do that. And I, I, it's a question that you have to ask yourself. And I know you have asked it a million times because you always talk about it. And recently you and your wife were having a conversation about it. Of you know, what, How do you want to make your money? How do you want to make your living? You're really good at something. Do you want to spend another 10 years doing a job that you don't enjoy for little money? Or do you want the same? Do you want to try to do the thing that you, that you, let them up, 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 hey. <laughs> Whoa, do you want to try? That was rather Tourette syndrome-like. Well, I guess it was. Anyway. <laughs> right in the middle of the sentence. She just belted it out. Okay. But uh, 
It, 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 well, it's worth a try. It's worth testing his theory of the 50 items or whatever. Right. Putting out, you know, I have this stuff that I have written and it just sits. Okay, you can't hear it, but I'm going to ruffle the pages. This is one of those damned notebooks that I've written story after story after story. And right here, I'm going to show you, but it's not a video podcast. I, I can't hear the pages ruffling because you're not ruffling them. You're not. There's not even a notebook there. Why are you lying to the listener? I do lie a lot. Oh, well, it's only got seven stories. Usually in the first page of my notebook, I will write what projects are in this because I have a bunch of notebooks. Uh-huh. And... Seven stories in this notebook. How many of them are typed up and available? Um, three. Okay, that's actually better than I expected. Is that a recent notebook? Is that one from a while ago? How many notebooks would you say you have like this one that are just out there with t- stories that are written but untyped? So unable to be shared with anyone. And what would you say? Five notebooks? Probably I've got four or five notebooks that are like okay that. so that's full. possibly and, i if we say but, there's four untyped stories in this one possibly there's at right, least right, four there's in all a, of those there's also a novel in this <laughs> so most of them actually have way more stories so you understand that. yeah normally there, there would be 14 or 15 stories in a filled notebook so if we count up these novel. four stories and we do the math there's probably something in the neighborhood uh or four notebooks sorry there's probably something in the neighborhood of at least 20, yeah, but I would possibly as many as 30 or 40 written and finished stories that could be shared with people if only you made that your number one priority. Yeah, it, it's something to think about. And part of it is sharing. Yeah, I could share these stories with people because there are people that have said they like my stuff. And I love to hear that. You know, I don't believe it, <laughs> but I need to hear it again and again and again. I'm, I'm the, the pretty girl with the glasses. That because I wear glasses, and I was like, oh, I'm not pretty, because that girl doesn't wear glasses. Let me, I was going to come up with like a super dated reference for somebody who is pretty. Okay, wait, let me do this. Mimi Van Doren doesn't wear glasses, and so I can't be pretty. I just need constant, I need, I need the boys in the soda shop to tell me that I'm pretty over and over to again. To take your glasses off for a second and say, wow, you're pretty under there. Yeah. As though... It made any difference to the way your face looks. Well, they were Groucho glasses with the big nose and the <laughs> Oh, mustache. well, okay. I guess I can understand. Uh, Why do you have to wear those again? What's the uh, well, prescription? Don't judge my religious beliefs, okay? It's got certain... Uh, <laughs> you just got a douche of a optometrist. It's like, I'm sorry. All of our glasses that we have in this office are only the Groucho Marx ones. <laughs> you can get any kind of lens, but you have to have the... I'm sorry, it's... You can choose the plastic mustache or the bushy one made of horse hair. It's up to you, though. (laughs) We are the only optometrist for a thousand miles around, so you really you're you're kind of stuck with them. So okay, so that's one thing. But also, not just sharing stories. I could sell my stories. I could make money from the stories. And gosh, I'm sorry that this is a rerun, and you've heard all of this crap before, folks. But something that you tell me a lot and told me today. As Dean Wesley Smith says, you don't just have to sell that story. You can sell a collection of your stories. It's a little collection with like three or four four stories in it. And then you can sell that same story again in a collection of four or five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten stories. And I have the advantage of being able to do that and then selling audio versions of the story as well. And you were saying, well, then you could also sell a collection of audiobook stories. You know what I mean? And... Maybe you could figure out how to do the print-on-demand thing and sell an actual book that you could have in your hand, etc. There's that, that. What is it? The magic bakery? The magic piece of pie? The magic pie? I think he said the ma- magic bakery. Magic was bakery. It? Okay. Which is where you write a story and it has all these pieces of pie. That's what you're you've made when you write a story. It's a pie. And it's magic. So you can sell this piece, which is the audio, but you sell it and then it just comes back and you can sell it again. Because you the rights come because, back to you. Yeah, so like you rights... sell it to a, a, to a magazine and it's cool, but the rights come back to you and you can sell it to an anthology. Yeah. And you can sell it to a foreign market and you can sell it to a reprint market. And you sell it to a podcast. You know, you could give it to a bomb on the street in the donation cup. 
you got all sorts of options that you could do with these stories. It's 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 really special. Yeah, I, I, I until you mentioned the bum on the street, I was totally with you. <laughs> you were with me. Oh, okay. So yes, yeah, sorry. If I would apply myself and at least try, and then if I failed, okay, I failed. But it's better to try and fail than to always wonder what would have happened. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Right. I do. That's my opinion. It's a good segue into what we're going to talk about today, if we're actually going to talk about that. I don't know. Maybe we shouldn't. We could cut this off and make that a separate episode if you wanted to. I think and we just... should. I think this should be its own episode. We'll okay. Just talk about I won't one. segue into the Pixar rules then. Did but you, but you want to? Just as a teaser for the next episode, we're going to talk about Pixar rules for storytelling. Rule number one, you admire a character for trying more than for their success. Wow, dude, we could do a whole series based on those Pixar rules. And we could do a ser- uh, an episode where we just talk about Pixar movies. Gosh, if only we had some reason to do a bunch of episodes. But anyway, I... Like, like the month of February, for example. Right, right. <laughs> when was the last time we did that? that or we... the worst marathon ever, for example. What was the worst marathon ever? What was the, the circumstance? There was no there? good reason for it. We just did it somewhere in the middle of the summer. 13 episodes or something like that. Of Well, maybe we should do one called the second worst marathon ever. <laughs> and it includes all, all right. these Pixar that episodes. That sounds good to me. Would you want to do that? Sure, I'm down with that. We can do it while we're here because we got time. That's one thing that we have. There's no distractions. At no point is the kid going to come down the stairs. You guys, we ne- I never go to Big's house anymore. Never. I Like once every six to eight weeks I go to his house now. And there's never been a time that I didn't go to his house when we weren't recording and he suddenly froze. Looked up at the stairs and said, did you Cocked hear it? my ear and said, what? Did you hear it? Is, that, he, is that he on him? the stairs? Is he back? Is he crying? Which, of course, I have to do because I'm the one that always wears the headphones and you're the one that has ears that can actually hear something, whereas mine are plugged and only allowed to hear you. That's my own personal hell, but that's not what we're talking about here. But, in, in, I mean, in some ways, your son is like a malevolent Santa Claus. <laughs> and he might be coming tonight. Hey, be very quiet. He might go away. He might. Yeah. Is, is Don't he, let is him he hear there? us. Is, he, is, that, is that him on the roof? <laughs> I, think he, I think he's there. Okay, where's your rosary, son? That kind of thing. It's 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 a, it's a, 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 a okay. Maybe it's not the best analogy. A, a malevolent Santa. Yeah. Claus. The funny thing is, he's actually getting. But recently, oh, he pull crap is getting better. How many times have we wanted to go do something? And you're like, well, unfortunately, he had a nap today. Well, that's so all hell. Shall be yeah, that is one of those uh, things that we're still dealing with. But he's recently, finally, started sleeping the night through in his own bed. Which, oh my gosh, that's one of those... You were 17 when you finally started sleeping. Yeah, I, I, it took me a little longer. So that okay. shows you, A, what kind of a worthless piece of crap I am. And B, how much better this younger rising generation is. The high school drill team was really relieved when you started sleeping in your own bed. <laughs> but, uh, sorry, I couldn't quite sell it. I, it's, it's so alien to me, the idea of doing the whole drill team. Not alien to you. you no, yeah. The, so see, the, much, that, that was actually easy because the drill team? team was always, you know, there was the cheerleaders and the song leaders and the drill team was always like the lower tier. So it was much easier <laughs> to, to do the whole drill team as opposed to getting, I mean, it took me much longer Anyways, to be able to check off every one of the cheerleaders and song leaders. So, just there's that. My, my songs know what you did in the dark. <laughs> it's good that no one else does but your songs. Uh, uh, gosh, I wish I had stories like that. I wish I could tell you. Just like, okay. Do you remember when like Alex P. Keaton or, or whatever Kirk Cameron's character's name was on a, something Seaver? Wasn't it Mike? Mike Seaver. Remember when they somehow get two dates to the prom and neither of them knew about the other and they juggle them back and forth and we go, ah, or sorry, the studio audience, if there was a studio audience, was just, ah, of how they managed to, uh, the terrible to, to TV fool trope. these two girls. And then, of course, they find out at and, this inopportune time and, of course, they and both throw drink their drink in his face. thrown in their face. Wow, you saw that episode of <laughs> every sitcom ever. <laughs> yeah, they had a... T- a- one, it was it was funny because it was re- they did an episode of Community where Abed does that just because, you know, it's one of those tropes and Abed is 
fourth wall. But yeah, it, it was actually one of the better episodes. From the bad season. From the bad season, while simultaneously being one of the worst episodes <laughs> from that season. Because the best part about it was he had the two dates, and he was doing the two-date thing. But at the same time, he met the coat check girl, and she was helping him do this two-date thing. And he realized that he, he had actually feelings for the coat check had girl. feelings for the coat check girl, and he really liked her, and she liked him, and they needed to have a thing together. And then, of course, they never brought her back for the rest of the season. And then they would make references to that in season five where, oh, yes, and this might happen and you might uh, really make a connection with some girl that will never come back again. (laughs) And then she showed up and they started dating for a little while, too. It was uh, so she did come back again. Right. But after that, they made the joke, obviously. But she didn't come back again in the whole rest of the fourth season. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. It was it was interesting because it was so forced. Normally, the hijinks are a little more hijinksy, but in the fourth season, Abed would just be like, "Oh, there's a TV trope where you have two dates at the prom, and so I am going to do that this episode." Where it wasn't clever, it just right. He would just announce it. He would this say, is show. "This is the trope, and this is what I'm going to do." Sometimes Abed, would be, oh, I've always wanted to do a bottle episode or something like that. But everybody else would always be like, oh, would you stop with this stupid crap? Instead, I don't know, in the fourth season, it just seemed so much more forced than it was before. But that's beside the point. We were talking about writing and publishing stuff. We were, yeah. Uh, You know, there's been a lot of talk about this next song. Maybe too much talk. Uh, uh, There there, there was a lot of talk. Trying to shut us down. That's right. This is not a rebel song. This is Sunday, bloody Sunday. There was a lot of talk about 2015, about this year. This was the year that we were going to write the novel. And this is the year that we're going to, that I'm finally going to make a baby. And, you know, all this stuff. But two, two check marks. So it's like, I've, I've done two of the, the three things that we're going to do. And uh, I, 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 it seems like we had some kind of publishing goal as well. Um, or Was that even this year? What was the year where you're just like, okay... I will by the time I turn eight. Oh yeah, that w- well, that started last year. My five-year plan was oh. before my uh, just a little before my fortieth. You're an old fart now, birthday. Yeah, it was a bunch of things that I I'm going to do this and this. I'm going to be working towards this, and of course, I've failed miserably at all of my goals because that's what I do. Including the writing a novel thing, which I mean, I, I obviously it's still a goal of mine, and I still plan to. But the three months over the summer have been utter abject failure as far as that goes. Which I don't know; it's a bummer. Um, my wife has been teetering on the brink of getting a promotion that will be a, a, a great, uh, a substantial step up for her. And, you know, a substantial boon to our family. Almost to the point where I could, like, quit my job and just be like, okay, we still make the same as what I, the two of us together used to kind of a thing. I don't know if it'll ever happen. Right, but Probably you know, will eventually because she, unlike me, has a really good work ethic, works really hard. I guess I have a good work ethic at work. But when it comes to other things, I can easily find something else to do when it comes to writing, when it comes to podcasting, when it comes to exercising. I always can fall off the wagon oh, and, you know, because I fell off the wagon on the side of the mountain where there was the really steep uh, drop off, then keep rolling all the way down the mountain. You know, that's kind of the way I tend to do it. But she's not like that. She... I think is going to eventually get there. Is her mountain waiting? Her, her mountain is mostly climbed. Oh, all right. my mountain is waiting, and I'm still like, oh, it's so it's it's over there. I think I should probably head in that direction. Okay, but if she got okay, you were telling me a little while ago that you got paid. Was it this week to no, do a little a, bit of your audio stuff? 
that somebody actually gave you money for doing what you do, like for the Dune Steve uh, and, and what you do. You had the equipment and you knew how to do it and you did it for somebody and they gave you money and your wife said, you should quit your job and do this. <laughs> right? am, am I phrasing it wrong? More or less, yeah. I, I of course... I reminded her, you remember that time when you said I should become a wedding video producer and we spent a bunch of money on a really expensive computer that could handle making videos and you quit your job, your part-time job that you were doing at the time so that, uh, you know, I could do that. And then, of course, that went absolutely nowhere because I'm a worthless piece of crap. And she said, the only thing you have to fear is fear itself. That may have pegged. I'm sorry, that was a little loud. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror. Yeah, that, I think when you really look back at it, that's probably my biggest stumbling block. That's the word I'm trying to think of. And, and I think it's the same probably stumbling block that you run up against. Uh, you know, the fear of, I guess it's a fear of failure. Because I suppose as a man, that's probably the the biggest fear that men generally have. And there's those that can overlook it and they tend to be the excess, successful ones. And then there's those that let it paralyze them. They don't go anywhere, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that's what she was saying. She's like, you don't have any confidence in yourself. You You should, but you don't. And you're never going to go anywhere without that confidence. And I know that's mainly your trouble, too. You talk about you're afraid to share your stuff with people. Because, well, you know, what if they say it's no good and you've got no future, kid? You don't think you could handle that kind of rejection. Doc! <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I think the two of us are alike in some ways. I'm not sure. I couldn't explain. I have no idea how I can explain what, what it is that keeps me from writing like I should. And every time my wife says, oh, yeah, maybe I might get this promotion and then we'll make this much more. And I think, gosh, if she did that, I could quit my job and I could be a writer. But I can't sell that to her when I don't even write at all now. I can't say, oh, yeah, how about I quit my job and become a writer full time? And she'd be like, you don't write. I'm not going to let you quit your job so that you can just be a worthless layabout. I'll let you quit your job to do something that will actually earn us some money. You know, so every time I think... So, I, so that's what she was thinking about, is, is you, you doing the audio work is something that you might actually do. Probably, yes. It's something that I do. It's something I have knowledge for. I don't think that I would do it. That's why I said, hey, remember when I was going to be a video? Because I have the knowledge to do that, too. True. But to be self-employed like that... You kind of got to be a hustler, if you know what I'm saying. You can't oh, just yeah. sit around at home and pick your nose and wait for somebody to call. You have to go out and drum up the business. And I'm not the kind of person that can do that as far as I can see in myself. Maybe if I went to some Zig Ziglar seminars or something like that, I'd change, but I doubt it. Well, you tend to walk out of those seminars all hyped up and all pumped up and it's like wow i can change my life and three days later you're like oh gosh i haven't done any of that stuff right what, what happened to that feel oh I, I was so pumped up i felt like the world was my oyster and now even oysters aren't my oyster like, <laughs> oh, and now I, I still can't afford an oyster but yeah but that's part of why people pump tons of money into those kind of things and the seminars and the you know classes and the retreats and all that stuff is is you want to maintain that feeling that you felt when you walked out of that or when you were in that and I, I guess the real it's more than a feeling hey that's that's a good song unlike the one I'm about to sing <laughs> but the, the, what the, the thing that you have to do is is somehow and again tell me listener how to do this you have to find that within yourself to make yourself feel that way and make yourself move and get off your butt and, uh, you know, and hustle, like you were saying. And I don't know, I see the thing is, I didn't tell you, but I had a dream of the parallel universe wherein you were a wedding videographer. Uh huh. And uh, it was about mid-2008 when you killed yourself. <laughs> I can see that being the case. That would probably be very possible because you have to deal with 
the brides and the mothers of the brides. Yeah, certain and people who are a little freaky sometimes. That there's nothing more depressing than a wedding. <laughs> I'm not even a funeral because, dude, I know someday I'm going to die. I'll be here all all week, folks. Thank you. Tip your waitresses. Light them up. Anyhow, <laughs> I, I don't know. I when, when you told me that, and we may have to cut this out because it may be too an overshare. But when you told me that your wife was just like, wow, you can quit your job and do something that you're good at to make money and, and, and all that. I was just like, wow, she actually believes in you? <laughs> that flies in the face of everything you have ever said. And so that, that's the part we may have to cut. But I was like, that, that would be really cool to have somebody say, I know you're the man and the man's place is to provide and all that. But I make so much money at my job that I could float us both and you could do what makes you happy. Nobody says that, dude. Everybody is so selfish that nobody would do that. You, you wouldn't work in a dead-end job where you're miserable and you're stuck in traffic. Oh, well, you, <laughs> you do all of those things. But you wouldn't do it happily so that your wife could be... Could a find herself. worthless layabout? Oh, Well, could sorry. do what get, brings her joy. But yeah, see... And all that stuff. To have somebody say, I would be willing to do that. Now, I don't know that this new promotion is terrible. It sounds like it would be a way yeah, better it would actually be than a, what she's suffering through now. But all I hear about what she's doing now is misery. Right. See, the thing is, when she's talking about that, I, I think, uh, you know, I can't ask for the opportunity to stay home and be a writer if I'm not, you know, if I won't do it already. If I can say, hey, you know, I write an hour a day and I publish this and this and this and this and people are actually buying it and I, I make a dollar, a buck fifty a, a month off of this stuff now. Which is Pez money. Yeah. Uh, I can't say that now. <laughs> you, you can't even say you make Pez money? Right. Oh but, my gosh. Okay, sorry. Sorry, we'll cut that part out. But I was just <laughs> horrified at how little you have achieved your dreams. Let me... Uh... But if, <laughs> if you know, I, I, so thinking about that that is on the horizon, I think, gosh, it's time for me to get my freaking act together and start writing now so that when the possibility comes, I can say, hey, well, what do you think? But sadly, I still can't even do that. I, I've got, had the whole three months of this summer where we were supposed to at least do our best to write a novel. And what have I done? Jack Schmeep. Well, don't beat your, yourself up 100%. I mean, yes, you're a piece of crap. Mm -hmm. But you're not a bucket of old lady diarrhea. Okay. You showed me just today... That you have worked on this novel. That you, if you're a, a, a writer who's listening to the show, maybe you do this. But I, I don't know other writers. I've never seen somebody do this. But you did like this character profile <laughs> and you went out and you found pictures on the internet that fit the description of who this character is. So that you can always look at that picture and instantly you know who that is. It's like you cast it. Like you were making a movie and these are the guys and it, you had it on your phone and you showed it to me. And I was like, wow, I would never have thought to do that. That's really interesting. Now maybe I do that a little bit with the audio work where I'm like, okay, so this guy, this guy's James Earl Jones. And that way I can just, I've got it written down. Anytime King Mustafa talks, <laughs> it's James Earl Jones. Right? You know what I mean? Because right. I, I never have to think, oh shoot. What, how did, how did I do that voice? King Mustafa? I can just flip a switch in my head and the voice is going to be fairly the same. Right. If I'm thinking of a face, you know, a person or, you know, it doesn't have to be a celebrity. I'm not doing an impression. It can be well, my Uncle John. OK, so this guy's my Uncle John. How would Uncle John do that or whatever? It helps me immeasurably as a multi-award losing audio <laughs> creator. And uh, I just would, had no idea that you, that you could do that with a, uh, a novel. Although, a few years ago, I got contracted to help this guy. He was, he was a producer. He was a shyster producer. <laughs> uh, and he was going to make this movie. And, uh, you know, he wanted it to be a Pirates of the Caribbean type, Robin Hood type kind of, uh, gosh, a Count of Monte Cristo type thing. There's got to be a name for that kind of period adventure story, right? Mm -hmm. 
So we were talking about it and he's like, well, who, who would you want to be the, the main actor? And I was just like, me? I, like, I was casting it. But I didn't know that this guy was full of shit. I thought, I mean, because this guy had made movies. His name is in the credits as executive producer, as guy who didn't make a movie with Rich Outfield for movies that actually got made. And so I was just like, oh my gosh, he's asking me who I envision in this thing. And I was like, okay, there's this guy, Jack Davenport. And he's a British actor, and he was in the Pirates of the Caribbean movie. He was the the, the sailor that was the the suitor of the, the, the girl, the girl that you don't like. Kira Knightley. No Kira Knightley, Jack Davenport. And he's like, all right, Jack Davenport is. And I was like, oh my gosh, we just cast Jack Davenport in this movie that I haven't yet written? This is the greatest thing ever. I, I was just really excited by that, by the idea of that. And so whenever I wrote something for the main character, I thought of his cadence and his way of talking, you know, that he's kind of a stuffy British guy, but he has a sense of humor. And to make a long story short, none of that went anywhere. I was not paid. Those movies never got made. But for a little while, gosh, I remember calling you after these meetings. and I was like, oh, my gosh, this is going to happen, dude. I, my ship has come in. And it's, it's got one of those plague flags on it. But I, 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 it's like a black spot. It's kind of like the, 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 the flag of Japan, only it's... Bl- I, 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 anyway, I can't wait to go aboard. <laughs> Anyhow, I, I, so I, I guess I understand why you were doing that. Yeah, well, one time when I was in English class, we read... I want to say it was a Shirley Jackson novel called We Have All, Always, Always Lived, Lived in, in the, the Castle. Castle. Never heard of it. And, uh, okay... Anyways, the teacher just, for the heck of it, went through magazines and cut out pictures of people and uh, made a little poster like, this one's Jack and this one's Mary Cat. I don't remember what they all... I do remember Mary Cat and Constance. So he had people for Mary Cat and Constance and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And yeah, I just thought, oh, that's interesting. And yeah, I remember somebody because he'd cut out like this picture of some male model for one of the characters, and I remember some girl in the class was like, "Woo, this guy's really hot, Mister Capavilla. Awesome." By the way, that I know that story is made up because nobody would be named Capavilla, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know that I've ever actually done this before, but I thought it would be interesting. I this time around, and also with what's his face, uh, not my favorite writer, but. Uh, the guy who wrote the Alex Cross novels, in his mind, and you can tell because sometimes he'll mention it. James Patterson. But yeah, James Patterson, the writer, thank you for reminding me, was the guy who wrote the Alex Cross novels. And in his head, and you can tell as you read the books, because he mentions it again and again, that he's a, he'll say, oh yeah, some people say I look like Denzel Washington. So obviously he cast him in his head. And it wasn't Morgan Freeman who wound up playing him in the movies, or at least the first couple of movies. I don't know if they Tyler Perry played him in the reboot that went nowhere. Tyler Perry. They made a reboot? I assume they probably did, but... Anyways, yeah, he... It was all Denzel Washington, and they would mention it here and there. And so I assume that's probably something that he did when he did his pre-planning or whatever. So I thought it would be interesting to try... Just to find somebody that looked like them and say what the, to be able to describe them. I've only done that for a few characters. I have the main character, the two main characters, and then characters of the police, the the two detectives that uh, are kind of following up on what's going on with these people. And I did also look up some pictures of mythical creatures that were going to appear in the in the book and wanted to kind of have a this is what they look like so that I could describe them I thought that would be interesting uh, that's pr- possibly the most work that I've done I don't know there's been a few times where I've I've done some pre-planning work on it um, if I really put my mind to it it wouldn't take me that long to get a at least a basic outline I don't know though I feel like I be- what? Because it's a novel, it needs a lot more work done in the pre-planning stages so that I don't find myself stuck somewhere in the middle. I'm like, oh, well, I wrote 35,000 words, but now I'm going to have to scrap all that crap and start over because that doesn't work with what I've now come up with. 
because that would be devastating to me because 35,000 words would probably signify three months of work or something like that. Well, but yeah, how, how do you not kill yourself after wasting 35,000 words? Right, like, yeah. That's longer than anything you have ever written. Right, and so and it, oh, I, I guess it's fear again. I'm, I'm afraid to get onto that ship with the black flag or the bl- black spot in the middle. Is that what it was? Interesting ship. <laughs> I'm afraid to... I paid attention to like the riggings and there was like a big titted mermaid sculpture on the, on on the, the front, front and all that. But I didn't pay attention to the dead that were all like all over the... Uh, the it had one of those where the captain had been roped to the rigging <laughs> and all that. He's roped to the, to the, to the wheel the just wheel, right, so yeah. that... <laughs> so that it would make it into port. And I was just like, well, this is so cool. It Great. smells bad, but it must be the sea. It's a little yeah, salt air. I've, I've heard that low tide smells bad. So um, it's probably just that. <laughs> but it's, you and I have a lot in common on that front. And I found that as it got closer and closer to the deadline of it's time for me to start my novel this summer, the more excuses that I would invent to put it off and that I, I could just, you know, kind of thing. I, 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 I'm almost there. I, you know, I, I was going to set aside a month to plan and I haven't done that. So I need to plan and, you know, excuse after excuse. And they came rolling in and finally I kind of had a, an epiphany that I was afraid that I couldn't write a novel. I was afraid that this project was just too big for me, that I would fail. And so I just had to, change my mindset and say it's not a novel. It's just a story. And I can write a story because I've written a bunch of them. And it's just another story. And it's probably going to be a long story. But, you know, however long it ends up being is however long it ends up being. I can do that. I've already written a novel this year. So I know I can do that. But I didn't realize I was writing a novel. And so you were what done I'll... and counted up all the words. Right. And, said, and oh, so that's what I'll do again. And that freed me up at least psychologically to where I was actually able to start. And uh, I got farther than you did. Yeah. But anybody has gotten farther than I did. But I, I did stall out and it was only like this week that I stalled and it was just because, well, now what do I do? Okay. Maybe I should, uh, maybe I should write an outline. So I know where I'm going next and all that stuff. Uh, Do I really want to do that? Let me write another short story. Oh, there's a contest. I'm going to enter this contest. I was just so relieved, but I'm still writing. So I, I don't I don't feel like I'm a piece of crap. I don't feel like I'm a failure in any way. Piece of crap, I don't feel like I'm a failure in any way. Yeah, so I you... wrote a novel in 2015, maybe two. And so if I fail on this third one, this one that I said I was going to do, yeah, it's too bad because I said I was going to do it. I, I vowed. Remember, we vowed on the blood of announcer man that we would do it. Yeah, I've had a lot of things on the blood of announcer men <laughs> over the years, though. So I've, I've broken, I think, a lot of those vows so far. I can't really say that it has a lot of weight to it anymore. Okay, well, I, I, luckily he doesn't listen to the show, so he doesn't know this. <laughs> but, uh, well, he can't listen anymore because of all the blood we've spilled from him. It's, he can't even get out of his hospital bed anymore. But it didn't affect his hearing. It was blood from his rectum, okay? <laughs> The thing is, I, I said this is going to be the summer and we're going to do it and we're going to write a novel in 90 days. Although I never believed it. Did you? It, 90 days was just like, let's see, we're going to try. We're going to set aside 90 days to write. But I all of the time thought, well, it's probably going to take 120 days. It's probably, maybe it's going to take the rest of the year, right? 180, around the world in 80 days. I don't know. Yes, the, all of those things, except for around the world in 80 days. So, I, you know, I felt bad or feel bad that I haven't written it, but I may still, just like you, have this framework that you've built and, and a story that's really solid. Uh, and I was, je- I was jealous of you for a long time because your idea sounded really good. I was like, wow, I would read that. Hell, I would murder him and write that. <laughs> and you don't have to murder me. Just write it. And then I'll, I, I'll even let you put, like, we could call it a collaboration. And then I'll just put my name, like, really small underneath, like the James Patterson collaborator. You know what I mean? Which is James Patterson, Patterson. and guest. And the guest is the guy who really wrote it. <laughs> yeah. And James Patterson just came up with the idea and said, hey, I got this idea about uh, a gauntlet. Okay. Can you write a book on it? Go. And then puts his, you know, I, I'd be happy with that. Then I could say, hey, I wrote a novel. See, look, my name's on it. It sounds like we're talking about how 
how big of failures we are. Mostly, but, we're talking more about how big of a failure I, I am. Okay, that's that's granted. <laughs> yes, it does sound like we're <laughs> pissing on poor Big Yankovic in this episode, and I don't mean to it. We don't we mean need to, to say he doesn't deserve on it. On that band that sings "Light 'em up, 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 light 'em up, up." Did, did we ever figure out who sang that? Light 'em up, up, I up, I'm on fire. It's Fallout Boy. We came to the oh. conclusion of. You know, that's a Simpsons reference. Oh, those it? guys need to fudge it. Oh, you're right. It is. Anyway, uh, I used to like that song until today. <laughs> so, so it sounds like we're making fun of you. And, and I, uh, obviously I am making fun of you. But it sounds like we're talking about you being a failure. But you could still write that. It's not, it's not I had my one chance to be a novelist. And you could have been, been a contender. Oh, sorry. I was going with the, 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 the other. Right. The other you could uh, have been a real cop, and you blew it. That one. I could have been a contender, but now it's too late. I'm an old, washed-up dock hand. That's not the case yet. No, you still have it. You you have the thing on your phone. I'd like you to write it so that I could read it and or steal it and <laughs> do the audiobook and get half of whatever. Well, sorry, a quarter of whatever. I think Audible has actually changed it, so you don't even get a quarter. So they keep like 70%. You get a quarter. It's just the uh, actual yes. quarter. Yes. You, they yeah. sell it for $30. You get a quarter. Not a quarter of the $30. <laughs> a actual quarter. Which, in the spirit of full disclosure, is still better than traditional publishing. <laughs> That's probably true. But you could still write the gauntlet. It's still a good idea. It's not. It wasn't a tomato. Or what's, one of, what's the thing where you have to eat it just right between? Like there's a week. Oh, that it's right. Strawberries are that way. Oh my gosh. They're hard and sour and awful. And then for about 15 minutes, they're the world's greatest food. They taste so amazing that if you could eat just those exactly right, it would be heaven. I mean, it would be heaven on earth. It would be like there would be angels, seraphim and cherubim sitting right over your shoulders playing harps. And golden trees. So basically your senior year of high school. Right. Would be that. And then after that 15 minutes is up, yeah, they're... they're mushy. Mushy and things. awful and you eat it and they're full of like mold inside that you didn't see. And they're, strawberries are like that. So, so maybe the, that's what you're talking the about. The point we were trying to make is that your novel is not that. It's not a strawberry. It's a... It's pecan. one of those... <laughs> It's a. It's, it's a, one of those crackers from the '80s that's filled with those uh, preservatives that are not even allowed to be put in food anymore. But, but back then, you could, and they they lasted forever. They would never ever go bad. The you know the the apocalypse will come and go, and the zombies will have all run out of whatever it was that driv- drove them. And that one last man on earth will still find that cracker and be like, hey, this is still good. Awesome. Oh, that's yeah, what sorry, the idea that's is like. what the gauntlet is. I, I, <laughs> I don't know. I'm totally I, uh, confusing you with these way too long and drawn out metaphors. <laughs> By the time we're done with the metaphor, you're like, eh, what were we comparing this to? Well, see, now I'm thinking about zombie movies and yawning, which yeah. is two strikes. I, oh, okay. The whole point of this was... That you can still do it. That you're not a failure. Well, you're a failure. I'm a failure, but I don't have to always remain a failure. There is the possibility to redeem myself, which I still mean to do. I may have failed. And, you know, you talked about how you came up with excuses as time came closer and closer. And then you came up with more excuses. And then my reaction was... Like a turtle, I just like retreated further and further into the shell. And I was doing an ankle cast every month. The Right at the start of the month, I'd be like, oh, here's the ankle cast, and this is what's going on. And we're leading up to this, and I'm getting ready, and this is my story, and I'm going to do it. And then when I found that I wasn't doing it, I was just like, um, I'm not, I'm not going to do the ankle cast this month. And then a whole nother month went by, and I was like, yeah, I'm still not going to do an ankle cast this month because... Well, I don't want to have to face it. I don't want to have to stand up in front of everybody and admit, okay, I sucked. You admire a character for trying more than their successes. And nobody's going to admire me for anything. I A, I didn't have a success. B, I didn't even try. I'm an utter, abject, 
bottom of the barrel failure when it comes to this whole experiment that we went to and it it's hard for me to face that we it weren't, that you weren't that though yes but i'm you're saying that it's not over nothing is over you're saying nothing. that this thing is it doesn't have to end yeah it probably did peg uh, it doesn't. It doesn't have to end here. It didn't. Ha- I'm, the the idea is still good, still worth writing, is what you're saying. But you're not saying that I didn't fail at the we're going to write a novel in three months this summer thing because I did. There's no way to not say that because that would just be lying. The truth is, and everybody knows it, that I did fail. And right, but I. F- it's hard to face. I failed too. True. But I don't feel like a failure. I don't give a crap. <laughs> And maybe that's worse. Maybe it's just like, hey, I don't know. well, it's not because you've got notebooks full of writing. You did the work. You you can be admired because you tried. Okay. Well, but did you listen? You had Bria and Marshall and Tom and the people that listen to your podcast. Yep, those are the God three. knows why. <laughs> and they always encourage you. It's like, oh, cool! I want you to read your book. You know, I'll be first in line to pirate it off the internet. <laughs> But only you can make it happen. You know, the, the, a hundred fans expecting your book doesn't make you write it. You have to do it. And mm-hmm. and I, gosh, I, I mean, it would be so cool if you knew that if you wrote it, you would make $10,000 or $100,000 or make it with Angelina Jolie or something like that. But you don't know. And that's part of what makes life difficult. And, you know, it's always when situation with girls you know it's like you go up to this girl I, I could go talk to her I could could go I could go try and buy her a drink I could ask her to dance I need to be like the guy on Dumb and Dumber that goes so you're saying there's a chance that's a beautiful attitude I wish I had that attitude but but part of it you know there's always a voice that says there's no point in going up and you know you're just going to be hurt and you're going to be humiliated and you're going to be alone which is what you are anyway so it would just be pain upon how you feel now but if it was a guarantee if somebody said no 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 if you put forth the effort you could come up with something really clever and be a douchebag because that's what you have to do we're back in la by the way <laughs> this is california then she talking? will go out with you and and things will look bright and you'll finally understand what those Katy perry songs are about i would do it you would put yourself on the line you would be like okay okay i, I will do it you know it's kind of like you know you, you if you exercise every day and if you lose X number of pounds or whatever, you will live another X number of years and they will be good and you will be happy and, and et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, there's no guarantee to that. You could still be killed by a taxi cab three weeks from now or whatever. And you're like, damn it, I died hungry. <laughs> I don't know if there are guarantees in life or anything like that. But somehow you've got to take a step over all of that stuff in comfort zone and, and just try and that's what we admire. Yeah. I do admire Jim Carrey in Dumb and Dumber. I know that it's not a great movie and all that stuff. Although, is it? It's um, a pretty. It's up there but, in the realm of comedy movies. I have to admit. But when Lauren Holly says to him, "What does she say?" It's something about she not, says uh, something about the chance. He's like, "What? What would you say the chance of us getting together? Like one in ten? And she I goes, could, "Not good, Lloyd." And he's like, "So like one in a thousand? She's like, I'd say more like one in a million." And he, and he pauses, and we're like, "Oh gosh, he's just been destroyed." And they go, "So you're saying there's a chance?" He married her in real life, so there is something admirable <laughs> about that. You know what I'm saying? I think that that's kind of cool. Um, He married her in real life because he wasn't Lloyd Christmas, though. (laughs) I know that. But at the same time, there is something you admire. He married her in real life because he's a millionaire comedian (laughs) named Jim Carrey. (laughs) It wasn't a one in a million chance there. I know, but he's a goofy looking guy with a chipped tooth and a bowl haircut or whatever. And she was beautiful. (laughs) You know, it just, I... Yeah, I, you can you do admire him still for saying that, and it's obvious it's funny when he he doesn't get it, you know, because he's Lloyd Christmas and he's not too bright. But yeah, I mean that's not something where you think, oh gosh, these guys are so dumb. You do somewhat admire him for it. being willing to throw his head against the wall a million times for that one where he may actually uh, finally break the wall down. 
I, I, yeah, I don't know how to help you. You, but you need to somehow summon your inner Jim Carrey and say, so you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> I'm going to have to add that to my inspirational montage now. I would smile big if it appeared on there. I don't know. I, I'm trying to salvage this episode so it doesn't sound like a complete down-in-the-dumps thing. Because somebody complained that they didn't want to listen to ankle cast anymore because it was <laughs> a depressing thing. And they kept expecting to hear a gunshot at <laughs> instead of that song. I don't know. That, 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 your life's not over unless that taxi cab comes along. Uh, there, there's always a chance to try again no matter how many times you've fallen down or whatever you can get up again and, and you know maybe it'll take getting up a hundred more times but maybe it'll only take three but it will take getting up and I feel like I am Zig Ziglar right thank now. you Zig everybody stand up with me now get up get up from your t- oh, not you sir in the wheelchair oh, oh Jesus somebody help him Oh, he had a colostomy bag. Oh, all oh, the smell, folks. Oh, I'm sorry. I've been Rich Outfield. And I've been Big Anklevich. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll be back with uh, the second worst marathon ever very soon. Light them up, puff, puff. I'm on fire. That really pisses me off. Or that gets my goat. Or whatever this is ultimately called is... Produced under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivative license. Very sad.